All right, then, if you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask that you turn to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 13, and begin reading in verse 22. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 22. The Bible says, and he, being the Lord Jesus Christ, and he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said, and he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. When once, when once the master of the house is risen up, and have shut to the door, and you began to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There, will, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets of the king, in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there, and behold, there are the last which... And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there shall be first which shall be last. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your watch care. We thank you for your word and its mighty ability. We thank you for the power that it has to convict us of our own sins, Lord. We thank you uh, tonight uh, that you would, if you would just meet with us, Lord, that you would stir us up to your service. Lord, convict the sinner tonight, Lord, that they might be saved, that you might open their heart, and that you would give them fresh life once again. Lord, we pray that you would honor your word with your presence, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching tonight in regards to uh, the Lord, uh, uh, the door is going to shut. The door is going to shut. Now, if you're lost tonight, you listen to me carefully, opportunity is passing by. Every day that goes by, another opportunity is missed. Now, that's not Armenian doctrine, I'm telling you the truth. Every day that passes by is another day that, that uh, uh, souls could be redeemed. Now, I want you to see the Lord Jesus Christ really was addressing two issues in this text. And the first issue that he addressed is false believers. And there is, I'm fearful that a great deal of those today that say they're saved and really don't understand even what that entails. Now, I want you to see it says, and he, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Now, listen, the Lord Jesus Christ was a missionary. He, and we all understand, only the elect will be redeemed. But have you ever thought about this? Jesus knew the redeemed. He could look at them and say, you know what? She's a devil. But he preached the gospel anyway. If you don't believe that, think about when he was addressing when he was addressing his twelve, and he says, "Have I not chosen uh, ye twelve, and one of ye is a devil?" He, he he knew who they were, but he went and preached everywhere, and that is my responsibility, and that is your responsibility is to go and share the gospel, and that's what the Lord Jesus did. He was out doing what the Father had bid him to do. Now, in verse 23, the Bible says, Then said one unto him, Lord. Now, if you've got your King James Bible, I want you to see that there's a capital L there. And that means that he recognized him as who he was. He didn't say teacher. 
He didn't say master. Master in the Bible does not mean like he's the master of the seas, which we know he is. That simply means teacher, like a master's degree in science. They weren't respecting him when they said good master. Uh, they were just saying you're a good teacher. That's, that's all that entailed. But here this individual calls him Lord. Now, I don't know about this individual specifically, but we see the Lord makes it very plain. Not everyone that says Lord is redeemed. Right. Not everyone that says Lord is saved. And so he says, um, this man says, are there few that be saved? Now, to answer the man's question, if you want a, a one-word answer, yes. There are very few that saved. If you, if you think about all the totality of the people that are still serving the Lord when this thing ends, there are few that are saved. You know, you know we, we like the tulip, don't we? But the P is perseverance. That means the redeemed will last. We have to believe that. So if that's true and someone says they're saved and they, they get out and live like dogs all their life, I have no, no certainty whatever that they've ever tasted of the goodness of Christ. And so if there was a one word answer to, are there few that be saved? Yes, there are very few that are truly saved. And, and uh, you have these blowout churches with ten and 15,000. The only thing I can say is it doesn't line up with the Bible. It, it doesn't line up with this book. Now, as he answers them, and he said unto them, meaning Christ, and he said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Now, I want you to notice two things, because a lot of people uh, <laughs> want to put works for salvation. But don't minimize it. He said, strive. He says, you work at it. Now, it wasn't work for salvation. But I tell you what this, we all need to do occasionally is make our calling and election sure. And that's striving. Do I really have something that's real? Or have I been playing a game? Do I really know the Lord Jesus Christ? Or am I just asking, or I'm just repeating what Mama told me to say? Do I have something real? So when he says strive to enter at the straight gate, that's exactly what he meant. He meant strive to enter in. Be sure that you know that you're sure. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Now, uh, he'll go into more detail in a moment with that, but it, it says what it says, it means what it says. There's a lot of people out there looking that never find. Amen. And you know what they mostly are? Religious people. People that look good and act good and show up and wash the windows to the church building and do all these goody goodies, but never have tasted of the goodness of Christ. Yeah. Now that, that, that's what he's saying. And so we as the Lord's people need to take an eval of that and know that we have something that goes beyond the grave. Something that, that will last right into eternity. And so he says very plainly, there's not that many. Verse 25. When once the master of the house, meaning the Lord God, is risen up, when the Lord Jesus is risen up, and has shut to the door, and you began to stand without and knock, Oh, at the door, say, Lord, Lord, open up to us. And you shall answer and say, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Now, again, religious people doing all the things right, going, let me in, let me in. He said, I don't even know you. Well, you won't in my house. I don't even know who you are. And then he says, did we not do this? Did we not do that? And he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, because I never knew you. So, it's very important to know Christ. But it's far more important that he knows you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there's not a person under the sound of my voice that probably even remembers hearing the name of Jesus the first time in their life. I really don't. I, ha I have no idea. 
There's always been uh, some knowledge of Jesus in my head. But it wasn't to a 12-year-old boy that I knew him. I knew about him, but I didn't know him. And you know what? There will be a great deal of people that day that thinks they have all these glorious and wondrous relationships. And he says, I don't even know you. Who are you? Now, he is part of God and he is sovereign like God. And he is all-knowing like God. So he knows them in a sense he's aware that they exist. But he don't know them in the lordship of his life. You know what? Every one of you know me as your pastor. Some of you know me as your family. But uh, there are maybe one or two in here that know me as a nurse. You see what I'm saying? I, you know me in a lot of ways, but you don't know me in every way. Uh, I started an IV on that one. I grew blood on this one and this one and that one. And in that sense, they know me as a nurse. But many of you don't. They, Christ knows that they exist. But if they don't know Him, He don't know them in redemption. He don't know them in salvation. He don't know them as one of the redeemed, one of the elect. He don't know them. And so it says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. In the sense that He knew, in the sense of redemption. So we see that He's very pointed at them when He says this. Verse 26 they remind the Lord of his, their religion. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast talked in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know not which ye are. Now, I want you to see in verse 26, what he is describing there is religion. Have we not drank with you? Have we not eaten with you? What do the Catholics believe concerning uh, the, the Lord's Supper? They lay, but they believe in transgenesis, I can't say it right, that it literally becomes the blood and the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Have I not eaten with you? Have I not drank with you? I don't even know you. So, they're putting their religion, equating religion with knowing Christ, and it is not the same. Good five point Baptist doctrine is not knowing Christ. There's a huge difference. And so, what we need to decide, do we know Christ or do we know religion? Do we know Christ or do we simply know facts about that book? Do you know Christ? That's all that really matters. You know what? I enjoy uh, the teachings of that book. I, 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 I thrill at the truth that's revealed. But what my biggest concern is, do I know Jesus? Because nothing else really matters, does it? Except that you know Christ. So he tells them, I don't even know who you are. Then he says to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Now, they were religious, right? They said, didn't we, didn't we learn in your presence? Didn't, didn't, we, didn't we eat and drink together? So all that religion alone... Christ here equates to iniquity. So if you're a fake, and you know you're a fake, that much more iniquity for you. Did you ever think about that? You know, your fakeness will be revealed. The Bible says for some, it will be revealed in the last day. But a lot of you, a lot of people, listen, you're not nearly as coy and captivating as you think you are. Because the Bible says by their fruits you will know them. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. How many people are joyous tonight? Yeah. That's it. Come in to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ right here in Dover, Tennessee. Come in like, like you've been drug in behind a truck somewhere. Listen, we're meeting with the very people of God. Yeah. And so we see then, in that day, they thought everything was okay. And he says, listen, all that fakeness, all that pretending is nothing but iniquity. I hate it. Verse 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, 
That was a Jewish thing. They knew what weeping and gnashing of teeth was about. It, it, it was part of their grieving process. It was, part, it, it was part of when there was a death in the family. And, and they would go through this ritualistic thing. had a great deal to do with sackcloth and ashes. It, it was a repentance type thing. And, but see, in that day, it will be too late for repentance. The Bible says very plainly, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus... Jesus is Lord of all. Amen. But you know what? In that day, it's too late. You will confess it because He said you would. But it won't have one ounce of redemption. In fact, you can cast you into the lake of fire. That, that, that's, the ultimate, that's the ultimate end. And, and so we see then that, that the Lord Jesus emphasizes that, listen, it's more than just a routine. It's more than just religion. So he, does, he addresses their Jewness, and that really makes them mad. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets, such as Isaiah, Isaiah Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, you'll see all of them, all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and ye yourselves thrust out. Now, he wipes the platter clean there because he says, your Junus, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, it means nothing. You know what? Your badness means nothing. Amen. Being a good, sound Baptist is fine, but it has no more to do with redemption than being a Jew. So you better know that you know. You better, you better, you better, uh, you better know that that you understand the truth of the Word of God, and that the Lord Jesus Christ is somewhere in your life manifesting Himself to you. Verse twenty nine, and they shall come, and this is the, this is nah, this is the redeemed, and they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Now, uh, and I understand what they're saying. Like it says, that's all the Jews coming home. Yes and no. Because what does it tell you? When is this going to be? It's going to be in the kingdom, the millennial reign. Uh, the battle in the, in, in the valley of Jehoshaphat is over with. So you know who else is coming? Me and who else ever is redeemed in this room tonight will be there too. We'll be in that city. We'll be enjoying that time of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not just the Jews returning home. It's us too. If you're saved. If you're redeemed. If you've been born again. And, and so we see. And this is the part I love in verse 30. And behold. There are last. Which shall be first. Now I've heard a lot of different teachings on this. And everybody say. And I do understand this. Because it, it somewhat coincides. With, uh, with uh, the teaching concerning. Uh, the, where you were, they were asked to move rooms. You remember that? And one thought he ought to be up here. And he says well you need to go down here to the basement. Now, th this is not your place. And, and it is that way sometimes. But who was first? The Jews. And now the people of, the, uh, of Jesus are first. We're not Jews. <clears throat> Wake up and smell the coffee. I, I am a Gentile. I am a saved Gentile, but I am of the Gentile race. And in that kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be first. We'll be first, and then those Jews <laughs> will be last. And why is it that? I, I can't tell you why. The only thing I say is this. Is they did reject the very Son of God. And so we see, we see then, we as the Lord's people, certainly ought to understand and know uh, that, uh, uh, that this thing is coming to an end. Th this time is almost over. The door is going to shut. The, the master is going to slam the door shut. And that's going to be it. Judgment's coming. After that, there's nothing left. Room for nothing but judgment. Look with me in Genesis chapter number six, 7. Genesis 7, the destruction of the old earth. 
Uh, Genesis 7, we'll begin reading in verse 13. Genesis 7 and verse 13. In the self same day, or in the very same day, in the self same day, entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. You know how many, you know how much, how much room there was in the ark? Enough for eight people. And then the, the rest of the created beings. You know what that says to me? That's a very few people. The Bible says the whole earth had been covered with people by that time. From the days of Adam to the days of Noah, uh, they had multiplied unbelievably. But eight souls were saved. That's a pretty limited number, is it not? I want to make us talk and stop and, and look at ourselves real carefully. Because you know what? There wasn't room on the earth ark for nine. I fully believe that. There is no empty space. Because you know what that is? That's particular redemption. There was, enough, there was enough room for eight souls and that was it. And you know why? Because God prepared it that way. And so we see it then uh, as the Lord's people that, that we ought to certainly rejoice and be glad and be certain that we're among that number. Now notice in verse 14, then they, and meaning the group of people, they and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort, and they went into Noah, they went in unto Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh were in his breath of life. Now, I'll interject something about a great and wonderful God. You know what? You've seen some of those foolish movies about the ark and how Mrs. Noah's gathering up pheasants and stuff to carry into the ark. That's garbage. That's right. They walked in because God told them to. They lined up, and, and even the most vicious wolf that you can think of came in there and like a little lamb and hopped in his, in his slot because God told him to. Very orderly set of events. They, they, they all had their place in the ark, and, and, and they all had things to do. They, they all followed God's perfect design. And they went in unto no and they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, where there is breath of life, and they went in and they and they that went in went in male and female of all flesh, so God as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now, I want you to see, just like in the days that, that is predicted by the Lord Jesus Christ, that there was a time, and there was an event, and finally, God shut the door. And you know what? Nobody else got back in. Nobody else re-entered. And you know, according to the Word of God, the best I can read it, they were there seven days before the first drop of rain fell. All right. And, and I, you try this one on for seven this week. <laughs> If that is not a type of us being called away before the judgment of this earth, I don't know what would be. I, I, I believe fully there is a, a pre-tribulation calling out of God's people. We'll be moved before it really gets bad. And so then we know that the fountains of the deep, deep broke off and, and the whole world was destroyed. But I want you to see that there was a cutoff point. Listen, people, tonight, I beg you, consider the things of Christ because there is a cutoff point. There is coming a day when there will be no more. There is coming a day when that's it, that's done. And so be certain that you're certain that you're certain that you know the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else matters. Nothing whatsoever in this world can, can even hold a candle to that one thing that is all that's important. Now I want you to go with me to one more place in the Gospel of Mark chapter 13. Mark is a very interesting Gospel. It's 
very short. It gives you very concise things. It doesn't ramble on and on, but it gives you a, a, a very clear view of what's happening. Gospel of Mark chapter 13 and verse 28. Mark 13 and verse 28, the Bible says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, uh, I believe that there are definitely applications here to the nation of Israel. And we know that she became a nation again in 1948. And that began to make us look. But let me say this, and we'll get to a minute. No man knoweth the day or the hour. But uh, I'll let you give you this to chew on. They don't have the Temple Mount yet. And they've got to have the Temple Mount. In fact, the Temple Mount is the very essence of Jerusalem, is it not? They've got to have the mountain, they don't have it yet. But when they get it, look out. When, when, when it belongs back to them, and I don't know how it will occur, but I believe that uh, ungodly mosque will one, be, one day be obliterated. I don't know if it will be by the hand of man or if it will be by the hand of God. But listen, I know this. Korah learned out the hard way what God can do when He wants to. And could you imagine what a glorious thing if the earth just opened her mouth and swallowed that ungodly, idolatrous thing and cleaned the Temple Mount Himself? You know what? Our God's able. And you know what a, what a wonderful thing that would be. And so we see then that uh, let definitely, definitely know that things begin to bud some now 70 years ago. Almost 70 years ago. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass till all things be done. Mm -hmm. Now, again, think about what he's saying. Because Israel became a nation in 1948. Those folks are now nearly 70 years old. I've heard preach all my life that that's when he'll come. But remember, they did not have the Temple Mount, and they do not have the Temple Mount yet. So, you look, you look at the time when they do get it, because things is going to get good. Things are going to get quick. And, and, and so we see that uh, he, he gives us that, that, that sign, that, that time, he says you, you look that way as this begins to happen. Verily or truly I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now you know what? It may become illegal to have you a good King James Bible. They may come and stomp every one of them out. They may, they may burn them up and, and nothing be left. But you know what? His promises will never, ever, ever pass away. If, if this is gone and there's nothing else left for me to read until my little four-year-old daughter, listen, he's coming. There's a man named Jesus. He lived a sinless, perfect life and he died for his people. You know what? The Lord has passed away. Remember, remember what the Lord told uh, the, the Israelites as they were leaving Egypt? He says, you tell it to your children and your children's children and your children's children's children. And that's what, you know, if we do it like that, the word ain't going to pass away. It'll always be there. And so we see, we see then that uh, it's a, a thing of permanence that the Lord has given us. Verse 32. But, the day, but of that day and that hour, not even Jack Van Impey, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father, but the Father. And Matthew's Gospel says the Father only. You know who knows the return? The Lord God Jehovah. Not even Christ Himself knows it. But He's sitting on ready. As soon as He said, you go. He's ready. He's standing there waiting. 
And, and so we see that when people begin to make these foolish predictions, keep that in the back of your mind. Take ye heed and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. That's right. Now, two things there. First of all, he gave us authority. And he says, you go. He was addressing the church, not, not just preachers. He was saying, you go. And then he set the porter there to watch. Now, you know who? Your porter's not me. Your porter's the Holy Ghost. And you listen to it. Because when he says troubles around, you, 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 better, you better take heed troubles around. If he tells you you're a fake, you better listen to him. Because he, 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 he knows a whole lot better than you do. He, he, he is part of the deity. He's part of the Godhead. So he knows your situation. And so he says, the porter's there. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh. At evening, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Now I've heard some people say, well I believe it will be on the morning one day because it says it's coming from the east. Uh -huh. Well the problem is this, that the Bible doesn't say that. And the Bible says it can't, that it could be at any time during the day. And another thing is this, if you've ever traveled very much, you know what? Right now where Brother Downs is, it's 8 in the morning. It's about time to go to bed here in Tennessee. But in other parts of the earth, it's morning. So you can't say he's coming in the morning because I'll have to say the morning where. Where is it going to be morning? And what time is it going to be in the good old USA? And so when people begin to say all this, all that, listen, you evaluate it carefully because no one really knows. Watch ye therefore, for you know not what the, not when the master of the house cometh, or even at midnight, or the cock, or, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, right. lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Now, if you're redeemed, if you're born again, you can still be sleeping. <coughs> now, I'll say that's a, a lot more rare case. Than most people say. Most people that claim to be just sleepy, and y'all all heard the tone, the term cold and indifferent to the things of God, and I know what they're meaning, but if I got in that shape, I'd make my call and election sure. Because I say there's a lot more people lost than cold and indifferent. Does that make sense? I, I, I would be real careful about that. I wouldn't sell myself short. Well, you know, I've just got so much going on and my life is so busy. Um, you know, I, I know I know the Lord, but it's just such a hard time right now. That's fine, but you make the call and the election short. You, you make sure it's not something more to it than that. Because, listen, the bridegroom's coming. Uh, his, his time is approaching us. It's very, very near. Because remember, uh, I, I fully believe he'll take us out before then. Verse 37. And what I say unto you, I say unto you all, watch. So you watch, and you watch, and you watch. And you, you be careful, and you look at the things going around you, and you do that military watch, and you say, Hulk, who goes there? Why are you in my church? Why, why, why have you shown up? Are you the real thing? Because you know what the Bible says? In the last days, many shall come into, and, and say, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Yeah. Now, a lot of people say, they think, well, somebody come along and say, I'm, I, I'm Christ. The devil's way too, too savvy and too wise for that. But there'll be a lot coming in and have. All you have to do is be baptized. Everything's going to be fine. You just come right over here and everything will be good. You know what? They're deceivers. 
You know why Armenian doctrine sounds good? Because we can do it. It's all about us. Right? But what that is, that's a false Christ. You know what the Lord said? Uh, you know what uh, the, that Paul wrote in the 2 Corinthian letter? He says, And there be already many antichrists. That's people who are against Christ. That's people who are not preaching the truth. That's people that's telling you, you be baptized, you join the church, you say the sinner's prayer, everything's going to be okay. They're false. They're false. I would love to tell you a master solution to redemption. And if he's convicting you, trust him. If he, stor if he stirred you up and you know that you're lost, cry out to him. But there are no master there's life and it's granted from above. You know what? That's how it's always been, is it not? Life's given from above. And that's, that, that's all it can be. 